joining us. Uh, when I say us, this is Marcus Schaefer from Daimler and myself. We've met and spoke before about a number of things. And Marcus, thank you so much for finding time in, I know for sure, a very busy schedule to talk to me again. So um, first few questions, how are you? Have you had a nice holiday? And um, what sort of workload is in front of you now coming back? Well, Roger, good to, good to see you again and good to meet uh especially after, you know, a few days of summer break. Uh, so it was a kind of mix of a break, a nice break, and moving a little bit away from Germany and uh, having some relaxing days. And, but mixed, of course, in with work. There's no, no day really without work and maybe a little a phone conference. But um, anyway, it was a relaxing time, charging my personal batteries a little bit and getting ready for, for what's ahead of us. Uh, and there's a lot ahead of us. Oh, for sure. So let, let's start talking about some of that. Obviously, I'm going to talk about Formula E inevitably. Uh, just something briefly on, on that, have some thoughts. Um, the IAA in Munich uh, will be, I think, an extraordinary moment in time with some, some things. I guess you're going to be very much electric um, at that. Um, but can I just pick up on some of the announcements that were made only a few weeks ago now? Um, the new EV platform starting in 2025, uh, what can you tell us a bit more in detail about some of that without obviously going through all of it? I'm thinking particularly in terms of uh, range and charge speeds. So could you give us a little flavor of that, please, Marcus? Well, uh, you know, we felt very confident in accelerating our path to a CO2 neutral future. And, uh, you know, we announced this ambition 2039 becoming in 2039 completely CO2 neutral. Uh, but we felt when it comes to product that we should accelerate our product uh, launches when it comes to electric vehicles. And this was basically the announcement uh, uh, in July, tw July 22nd when we talked about our new platforms and being ready uh, to have a full range of vehicles and you know our entire fleet ready by 20, 2030, uh, just globally. So we announced uh, basically three platforms and, uh, you know, starting 2025, we will consolidate our passenger car platforms basically on one single platform covering from mid to large vehicles, uh, all our portfolio. We call it the MBEA, uh, the Mercedes-Benz Electric Architecture. So this will be the architecture combining our platform modules to a very, very efficient platform, scalable platform to carry our products for the future. We also announced a sports car platform. So we're going to turn AMG electric. So AMG will go electric, starting with a platform which we call AMG EA. Uh, we decided to have a separate platform because it's a dedicated sports car. And there's so many things you do differently when it comes to a sports car, a real sports car with ambition. And of course, that's AMG. So we decided to go with a specific electric platform. And we announced a third platform for our van division. Of course, we have the V class, uh, of course, for passenger car uh, purpose more, but also for uh, distribution of parcels and packages uh, and goods distribution. This is the van EA platform. So basically three new platform all coming around 2025. So there's a lot of work ahead of us. Yeah, sure. Um, well, you mentioned AMG there. You know I'm a fan of the SLS electric that you had. Wow, that's like over a decade ago. Um, when I spoke, well, you kindly arranged for me to meet some of your teams here in the UK in Brackley um, uh, and and. Uh, up at um, uh, uh, HPP, that, that was that was fascinating. Getting a glimpse into that, I'll talk about that in a, a little bit. But but just to summarise some of what you what you said there, though. So this will be with good range and good charging speed times, will it? In, in all of these vehicles we're talking about. Well, <clears throat> we we do think that uh, range, of course, matters and continues to matter. Um, you know, once maybe. In a, in a couple of years, end of this decade, you know, charging infrastructure will be around every corner. Uh, this is going to take time probably, but until this point in time, range is, I think it's going to be very important. So that's why we're going to see larger ranges coming up uh, with these platforms in the future, 
We're going to Good. improve our battery technology. And of course, charging time will be further reduced. And we talk about 20 or even more percent uh, in time reduction compared to a very competitive charging time that we have today already. Sure. So longer range, uh, faster charging. And this is coming with these new platforms. Great. But I, I do agree with you in that, you know, as charging infrastructure improves, that takes the pressure off having just these bigger, bigger, bigger batteries all the time. I, I can completely with you. There's definitely an, in, there will come an inflection point in, in that, uh, in that situation. Um, can we talk about um, the bigger kind of picture, sustainability, supply chains, you know, the whole journey of circular economics. I know the companies talked about this a lot, talked about it at CES a couple of years ago and, and other things. Um, what slightly concerns me, if I'm honest, Marcus, is it feels like everyone's joining quite a long queue now um, with all their sustainability objectives. Um, how do you, I mean, let's not, not talk about the others, but how will you ensure that you can deliver on plan, you know, a, a, and on budget? I see some of the stuff you're doing now is through acquisition to, to capture technology rather than, you know, uh, some of the re recent announcements you made um, in, in the presentation. Um, is that something that's going to happen more in the future? Have you got more acquisitions in the pipeline? I know you, you couldn't just tell me off, <laughs> off the record what they are, but, but yeah, how are you going to cope with this, this fact that everyone now is trying to change fast? How do you make sure you have a good place in the queue for all of that? Well, uh, you're, you're absolutely right. Um, you know, Mercedes Daimler is a large company. We have a great history. Uh, we have 10,000s of engineers in R&D. We have almost 20,000 engineers around the globe uh, working in research, uh, working in R&D and uh, a great uh, purchasing department. But uh, we know that uh, there's a lot of talent outside of this company. And, you know, we want to tap into this talent pool outside of this company when it comes to universities, <clears throat> when it comes to startups, but also when, especially when it comes to sustainability and raw materials, we think um, there's a great chance to do further corporations, uh, acquisitions, partnerships. And I think that's the recipe for the future uh, that we continue to seek uh, this kind of talents, this kind of partnerships uh, outside of timeline, outside of Mercedes. And globally, so uh, we constantly screen the globe uh, for, for this kind of opportunities. And uh, we think well, you, can, you can just wait for the next announcements definitely here. <laughs> so we're going to strengthen uh, our portfolio definitely. And strategically, uh, we're going to get much deeper involved in the raw material supply chain, uh, as we think this is a very, very critical uh, factor for the future. Yeah, I, I'm glad you've said that because you kind of intimated it last last time that we spoke. Um, and I know I, I, I picked out, again, in your, your most recent announcements, the, the partnership with Albemarle. I think that was particularly significant. But of course, it's not just about lithium. You know, it, it's, it's about manganese. It's about copper. It's about all, all of these commodities and not just the mining, it's in the mineral processing, et cetera. So, so yeah, I think that was that was good news. Good, good to see that. And of course, because they're they're only up the road from me here, uh, Marcus, Yasa have been a, you know a pretty pretty much a shining star for a few years. So I think you know, snapping those guys up was 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 a smart move. I think these degrees of vertical integration, building on the talent you've already got. Yeah, that, that's, that's, that's a smart move. That's definitely a smart move. Um, talking about batteries, um, again, I've noticed your presentation and, and others, um, there's quite a lot now hinging on the development of solid state you know, batteries, um, but we're not there yet. So, and I remember talking to Ola Kalenius about this four, four or five years ago. How do you sort of put this strategy together and, and the timings of, of vehicles and the delivery of battery capability when we're not there yet with some of that technology like solid state. Um, you know, LFP has definitely come back on to the radar hugely. So LFP, no cobalt, for example, which of course is good news in, in, in many ways. Um, but, you know, for, for low mileage customers, are there any particular chemistries you're looking at? You know, NCA, NCM, you know, anything 
what's the kind of without going through the whole thing because it's very complex and very detailed what, what's your sense of where we are with with battery chemistries and battery technology well all in all i have to say it's a very exciting field and uh so i'm personally very much involved in this topic and because it's, it's absolutely exciting what's going on on the battery chemistry side and it's such a fast moving um you know, field uh, with so many um, inventions, so many researchers, 10,000s of researching activities around the world. And, you know, every day, basically, you hear some news uh, somewhere out of our corporation's partnership, uh, some new steps are made there. So I think we have to screen the entire uh, field of research uh, with our competent team here. And yes, we're enlarging our team here. And uh, I'm right here in Stuttgart next to the place where we're going to build a 400 million investment for e-drive campus uh, with some wow. cell manufacturing capabilities in the future. So some very substantial uh, laboratory that can do um, uh, cells for, for even for serious vehicles here. So, uh, but we are not bound to one chemistry, as, as you rightly said. Uh, yes, we think LFP and LFP plus, I would call it, or an LFP plus uh, plus would be a great addition por for our portfolio and would have a place in our portfolio. The NCM, the NCA will further develop uh, with a high silicon anode that's going to continue to develop and give us higher and higher energy densities. And with our partnerships, for example, like Sila Nano uh, in the US, and we are making progress here to get really, really uh, high energy density up to 900 uh, watt hours per liter. Uh, so we're making progress there and there's still uh, progress to be made uh, that we see along the line. But at the same time, yes, solid state is developing, maybe slower than we thought. We all thought maybe a couple of years ago it would be there already in serious production. But obviously it's more complicated to go from a single layer cell uh, to multiple layer cells there. So there's not a breakthrough yet, but I believe very, very close. And that's why we're gonna be in partnerships that we are announcing also soon, uh, pretty soon in the next couple of weeks on the solid state side here. So stay tuned. Uh, so we're working on all these chemistries, but that's an interesting field to manage that into production. And that's a challenge we we gladly are uh, taking on. Yeah. Now, well, I think that leads very nicely into something. Uh, and I should thank you for this. You, you helped me um, go and meet up with some of the team from Bricksworth and Brackley um, a few months ago now, in fact, uh, to make my documentary Motorsport in the Electric Age. Now, I did that as a motorsport fan. You know, I've always loved Formula One um, and I've, you know, enjoyed watching Formula E. Absolutely. Been to races uh, with, with both series. So on the one hand, your recent announcement like Audi and BMW, uh, um, sorry, Audi and BMW have done of, of withdrawing from the series seemed disappointing. It, it, it is. There's, you know, of course it is, um, because having those manufacturers in the series was, was fantastic. But I have to say Having made that documentary, it said to me a few things about why Formula One still remains the pinnacle of engineering technology transfer. And I think particularly with batteries, um, and we mentioned a moment ago, SLS electric, and some of the things that really over the last, yeah, definitely decade or so, have been flowing into Formula um, One, uh, from Formula One into Formula E, and the other way, I heard that from, from uh, uh, the guys in, in Brackley, for sure. I uh, heard it from Mark Preston, from uh, Tachita. Um, Paddy Lowe had some interesting things to talk about uh, and that. But certainly Huel Thomas gave me a real flavor of, of where that is. And we talked, of course, about Vision EQXX. Um, so, yeah, I, I have to say, and I'm not just saying this because you and I are having a chat, I kind of understand why you know you've moved out of, of Formula E because perhaps counterintuitively, I can see, and I hope my documentary helped other people see, that there is a lot that's coming out of Formula One that is very useful for electrification, um, harvesting energy, battery technology and development, etc. So, 
So yeah, I, I, I think that was pretty cool. What can you tell me anything more about EQXX? Because that, that, that definitely has got some pretty good battery tech in it. Well, uh, you covered a lot of a lot of topics. Uh, I did, yeah. First. Sorry, it wasn't a good, moving, wasn't a simple question. Of, yeah, moving out of Formula E as a world champion, becoming the world champion, moving out of this series, uh, you know, sounded like a, a strange move. But I was trying to explain that, and I think you rightly covered it. Uh, we have to focus. We have to focus, and you know, as Mercedes inventor of the automobile, so with my team with trying to uh, really stretch boundaries and, uh, you know, just explore the next possible thing when it comes to technology. And yes, definitely it is Formula One. And it has to do with the regulations in Formula One, whether uh, uh, compared to other regulations in the other series. Uh, and it's always a, a balancing act between not, you know, overspending, of course, in the series but just making technological progress. And that's happening definitely in Formula One. And as Formula One, you know, has agreed to change and uh, I'm part of this group uh, with FIA and Formula One defining the next engine and uh, combustion, combustion powertrain, which will be largely electrified uh, in the future. So this really, uh, you know, shows me the, uh, that engineering can make progress in this direction. And it will serve our engineering organization uh, and back to the serious applications here. So yes, we're talking about battery cells and battery cell development, next generation of electric motors in Formula One, inverters, recuperation. And all these things are extremely relevant to our road cars as well. And we talk about sustainable fuel, which is not for our new cars relevant, but for the fleet outside, for the millions of cars outside. So. Uh, sustainable fuel is something, at least for the cars which are in the field today and needs to be taken care. So all the aspects of the new powertrain 2526 in Formula will cover the aspects which are relevant to a company like us, including the, the car park, which is out there. So that's why this decision to focus uh, on this motorsport activity here in F1. Um, when it comes to our activities in, in the UK at uh, Brixworth and Brackley, uh, I started this EQXX project and asked my engineers really stretch imagination, think about after tomorrow electric vehicles, and how can we make an ultra efficient electric vehicle? Um, so really beyond what we're gonna see uh, maybe in series in one or two, three years. And uh, I involved the Formula E guys uh, in Brixworth and the Formula One guys. And, you know, they were all fired up to help the engineering organization in Germany. And uh, so we we're forming one team and they will deliver the EQXS, which we show the world uh, in full beauty and execution then early next year, early next year. So we're very close uh, to finishing a car that we put on the road and we want to demonstrate this car on real road driving, so autobahn uh, city, not just turning in a, in a circle uh, with 30 miles per hour, uh, just in real road condition and show what, you know, this car can deliver in terms of uh, consumption. And, yes. you know, the goal was always to become a, a very efficient car consuming less than 10 kilowatt hours per 100 kilometers. So single digit was the goal when it comes to uh, consumption. Yes. And you know what? Um, the first question I asked Huell uh, when I went up to Brixworth was, it's 2031. Can I still go and watch a Formula One race? His answer, I think, captured much of what you've just described uh, and other things, which was, if Formula One is great entertainment and the technology transfer is relevant, then yes, you can go and see a Formula One race in 2031. I think he absolutely nailed it in that explanation. I think it was, you know, straightforward, honest, and that is the, the reality of it. So thank you for all of, um, yeah, and fixing that up. And I, I apologize, I should have actually said before I talked about all of this, you know, congratulations to Ian James and the team, you know, second year, second season in Formula E uh, to win the world championship. 
was a pretty impressive achievement. So yes, okay, you know, a frustration and sense of disappointment perhaps in, in moving on, but nonetheless, you know, uh, hats off to a, a very impressive um a very impressive season. So 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 great on that. Thanks for explaining all of that. That's, that's appreciated. Um now again another thing that stood out for me and I'm going to I'd like to quote something to be exactly right here is about charging infrastructure because whenever we're talking about EVs of course we talk about batteries and of course we should talk about charging infrastructure. So in the latest um um market presentation you gave Ola said this to make sure that everyone can drive sustainably in the future, we need an efficient public charging network. Its expansion must keep pace with the manufacturer's electric ramp up. That's our main message to policymakers, industry and government must work together on this. So given he said that, sorry about that bleeping, um, given that he said that, how will you and others ensure that that message, you know, translates into action. You know, how are we going to help cities, um, national governments, and the EU, and well beyond Europe, you know, deliver that 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 charging proposition that matches your output of EVs? Well, you you rightly mentioned uh, that that's going to be the next uh, huge challenge uh, in uh, EV adoption and uh, widely EV adoption in the market. So it has to be a great experience. And you know, you're you're driving an EV, I'm driving an EV, uh, and I'm you know driving longer distances. And we do this on purpose uh, with our management team. So we go on the roads and drive long distances, and. Uh, uh, without any support. So there's no support staff helping us, you know. Uh, yeah. We just have real life experience. And with this is just a couple uh, weeks ago with Ola Kalenius, our CEO. We just took some EV cars, just drove to a destination, and we had interesting experiences, uh, mildly saying, yes. uh, on this way. So charging stations not working, uh, payment issues, and so on. And these are the kind of issues that we have to resolve. And we're going to do whatever we can do as a company with our partnerships. So with the Mercedes Me Charge app and the partnerships we are establishing, you have access to 530,000 charging stations. Uh, so at least you are able to pay and access a charging station, which is already a hurdle because you have so many payment systems out there. Uh, we go one step further with the EQS, you have plug and charge. You just plug in, you don't even need a card or whatever device. You just plug in and payment is done automatically. I think this should be the standard uh, for the future in terms of um, seamlessness and uh, easy to use. But yes, the uh, network has to be expanded. And that's why we are in talks as a big player and a big industrial company with policymakers with the government of Germany. Uh, so we're doing everything we can to make the case uh, and to help advising uh, how to establish a network. Of course, we have our own investment, as you know, with Ionity, which yeah. is expanding uh, with ChargePoint. And just recently we announced uh, with Shell uh, a new partnership here uh, to move into the you know existing gas stations, which is the plan of Shell, uh, helping to establish a charging network, also with the existing energy companies here. So there are multiple ways uh, how we can make a difference here, make have, can have an impact with energy companies, with policymakers, with the German Automotive Association, for example, VDA, or with yeah. the European Car Maker Association, uh, ACEA. Uh, that's all you know uh, activities where we trying to make our case and uh, pushing as as much as we can accelerating the infrastructure great that's all good news and i'm, I'm very pl pleased to hear that um and as you said it, it, it is a big challenge um couple of quick questions just to sort of finish finish off i know we've spoken mostly about cars and and lots of other things but but to my mind, I had a long held belief that buses, taxis, vans, you know, commercial vehicles, they should be the things that we electrify first because they operate in our towns and cities 
and they can pollute a lot depending upon their age, et cetera. Um, so I know it's not your particular area as, as such, but you know, um, can you give me a bit of an outline as to how how quickly we can see um, you know, you're the biggest bus and truck company in the world from from what I think I have in, in you know is a correct fact. So, so how quickly can can that happen? Because um, I, I think we are seeing a tipping point now with that because commercial operators can see that the total cost of ownership, often now for running uh, electric fleets, you know, taxis, buses, vans, makes sense. So, so they're doing it for the economic reason mostly. What are you seeing, Marcus? Well, I think this is a, a very, very crucial point that you mentioned. So nobody is buying a truck because they like to have a truck for emotional reasons. <laughs> so they have it mostly for very, very economic reasons. And uh, so they have to do the TCO, the total cost of ownership calculation. And that's key. And that's what our you know, truck unit, uh, bus unit always has in mind. It has to pay back for customers here. Um, so costs are very, very important here. Um, but there's a clear strategy of the uh, truck and bus division to become also CO2 neutral uh, in Europe, in Japan, and in North America by 2039. Very substantial um, commitment. One of the first probably, I believe, uh, made by, by the competition here in the competition in trucks. Uh, and becoming totally CO2 neutral across the globe also by 2050 with the entire fleet. Um, important is what you see and what the actions are. And if I just look at the actions and you see delivery vans already out there being electrical. So the e-Vito or the e-Canter or the e-Sprinter, these, these vehicles are all available today. Uh, we are improving the range constantly. We're working on range and providing larger range but delivery uh, logistic companies are using uh, fleets of these electric vans today. They are available. We just launched the e-Actros. So now we go to heavy trucks, uh, uh, long haul trucks also. And this truck was launched and shown to public just a few weeks ago. And serious production uh, of this truck will start also soon. So there's a lot going on on the truck side here. Uh, great commitment, but we're going in a second technological direction here on the truck side, as we think fuel cell in some markets, long haul for long haul trucks, uh, isn't a real, real, real alternative. So we started our uh, fuel cell joint venture with Volvo. So a 50-50 joint venture, we are joining forces with another huge player in the truck market. So Volvo and Daimler joining forces building a fuel cell a company, Celentric, which just uh, you know, became official and established. Of course, working full speed ahead on the fuel cell of the future for long haul trucks. Hmm. So, and even working with governments on a infrastructure. So we're signing uh, you know, just agreements uh, in a consortium with others and governments uh, working towards a infrastructure, a charging infrastructure, which is, of course, for trucks, also key and, and, and very important. Yes. Well, look, for someone who's that isn't your, your complete area of responsibility, you clearly know an awful lot about that. Um, so that, that's really helpful. And I have to say, I watched the EACTROS presentation. And the thing that struck me about it was, of course, they talked about product. You know, product is always at the core of these things. But what impressed me was they talked about the the customers that they'd been trialing the vehicle with for a few years. They talked very much about charging and infrastructure. They talked about support, they talked about training. They talked about, you know, many things. And, and, and I thought that was refreshing from a manufacturer because, you know, I, I work for a manufacturer. I, I know that most of the proposition, certainly at the point of, you know, marketing, et cetera, is all about the product. But I think to talk about much more was a very smart move. And I was, I was genuinely impressed by that. And, and I, I remember saying so at the time. Um, look, there's a lot you have to do. I'm not going to keep you any longer, but I just would like to say thank you so much uh, for, for going through all this, you know, answering, answering the questions straightforwardly. Um, good luck with uh, IAA, um, IAA Mobility, New City, of course, Munich, um, not Frankfurt. So it's going to be very interesting. I'm, I'm lucky enough 
to be there for the whole week. I have a few sessions on stage with some interesting people. Um, so I'm looking forward to that. I'll definitely be coming and checking uh, you guys out. I'm sure most of it's going to be about electric, you know, some nice concepts and things like that. Um, but is there anything you'd like to say sort of finally? I mean, as you know, my, my LinkedIn audience is, is full of very smart people all around the world who've been following the electric vehicle journey for a long time. Um, I like to inform, educate, and if I can, occasionally entertain a bit. Um, so so what, what would you like to say to all of those people, Marcus? Well, f- first of all, thank, thank you for helping educating and bringing real facts to the, to the table and to the audience here. Uh, so I'm looking forward to uh, Munich, and um, it's not only a presentation of concept cars. So a Mercedes will uh, just show to the world another electric vehicle, uh, even mass mass uh, when it comes to production, mass production vehicle. So uh, great products to be seen. Uh, not only concepts, yes, some concepts, but uh, our next additions to the family of Mercedes electric vehicles uh, live on stage, and uh, I'm looking forward to see you there. Great, great. Thank you. Well, th- thanks very much. And uh, uh, again, see you soon. Uh, good luck in uh, Munich and um, all the best with, with all of these plans we've talked about. Thank you. Thank you, Roger. It's good seeing you.